One of the most pressing challenges we face today is violence and radicalization that originate on social media or the internet more broadly. Now, though we can look around and see examples of violent acts that appear to have originated on social media in one way or another, it's really hard to study them. The people who commit violent radical acts are typically not the type of people who want to talk to researchers like me. Instead, they tend to hide their radical ideas and behaviors until it's too late for us to stop them. In this video, I'm going to go over some reasons why we think that social media and the internet may be driving radicalization, but I'm also going to argue that our platforms, especially Google, provide interesting new opportunities to study the radicalization process for the very first time. Now, in order to think about why radicalization happens, we don't have a lot to work with, but we can go back to early theories in social science to try to understand why groups of people can develop violent animosity towards each other. Now, one of the oldest ideas in social science is the concept of group threat theory. We know that people tend to develop prejudice towards each other when they perceive a sense of threat to their status or to their physical security. Now, this sense of threat may not need to be tangible. It can exist in our imaginations but it tends to happen in places that are ethnically homogenous, where a queer majority group can be distinguished from a queer minority group, and especially in cases where majority and minority groups have to compete with each other for jobs or other resources. So as we think about this idea, group threat theory, we can use it to try to explain so-called homegrown terrorism. Homegrown terrorism is a bit of a political football, but broadly the idea is that people are becoming radicalized from inside countries instead of from outside of them in the kind of previous iteration of radicalization that we saw in many countries. So the idea is that what's driving the radicalization is a social process that's occurring within the countries themselves. Now, one of the most notable examples of this has been ISIS-inspired terrorism in Europe. We can also see the seeds of radicalization and these kinds of seeds of intergroup ha hatred bubbling up in America too, among groups that, for example, deride Im immigrants or believe they represent a existential threat to the United States. And so trying to unlock the clues of how these groups think and work, we can look to a lot of different cases. For example, the story of Mohammed Dakala and Jalen Young, a young Palestinian American and African American woman who were arrested for attempting to travel to Syria in 2016. They came from one of the most white regions of Mississippi and apparently suffered significant discrimination as Muslims. Perhaps, many have wondered, this type of discrimination created the sense of animosity, created the initial driver that made them sympathetic to the extremist narrative that made their young adulthood end so tragically in jail. Another very tragic example is that of Dylan Roof, the young man who murdered multiple people in a church in South Carolina. Roof said he was acting in defense of the white race. He said he was acting to protect his people. Roof, it turns out, had also grown up in a highly homogenous neighborhood for much of his life. He was one of the few white children in a predominantly African-American neighborhood. In both cases, we can speculate that the driver was the experience of marginalization, the experience of not fitting in, the experience of getting prejudice from the other group that you might not feel is rationalized or justified. And these types of feelings, which exist in many different people, and of course it takes a lot of different factors to compel someone to do something as awful as these individuals did, uh, but it seems to be an important ingredient. Now, the challenge in evaluating this idea is that, again, it's really hard to study people who are violent radicals. They don't really respond to surveys. They don't want to be interviewed. And people who have bigoted views, the type of views that might say anti-Muslim views that might have motivated Mohammed Dakala and Jalen Young, those are also very politically incorrect. And so people are usually reticent to share those types of views in public or with a researcher. And so it's really hard for us to measure both things we need to evaluate this hypothesis, both the 
anti-minority group sentiment and the anti-majority group sentiment that seem to feed off each other in this kind of tragic cycle of intergroup hatred. So one way that we've learned to do this is to look for clues in the digital traces that people leave behind on the internet and social media more broadly. Now, few people post about their, you know, violent activities uh, before, um, long enough before so that authorities can disrupt them. And even many of those who do perpetrate those types of acts don't announce them on social media. But we found that at some point, um, people typically use Google to do some type of research about how to engage with violent radical communities, or in the case of this discrimination question more broadly, people tend to share uh, Google search terms or phrases that kind of give us some clues about what they think about people. So in 2014 and 2016, I collaborated with two other researchers, and we collected data on the prevalence of both anti-Muslim search phrases and pro-ISIS search phrases, people Googling things like how to join ISIS, believe it or not. And what we did is we looked for patterns. We looked across the entire country, across near more than 3,000 counties in the United States, and we measured how often those anti-Muslim search terms um, exist, and then how often those pro-ISIS search terms exist. Now, we collected a ton more data. We looked at dozens and dozens of variables that describe characteristics of these communities, their size, and the internet penetration in these places, the number of people who could get online. And what we discovered is the single strongest predictor of pro-ISIS sentiment was anti-Muslim sentiment. Strengthening our prediction or our idea that uh, there is some kind of tragic intergroup hatred that seems to be developing and driving people, in this case, to Google how to join ISIS. Now, equally important, this same study showed that this relationship is even stronger in communities that are highly ethno ethnically homogenous, uh, that are mostly white in the case of the United States, and that have high levels of poverty, suggesting that these two factors contribute to this broader process of intergroup tension and escalation. Now, ours was but one study of one country on one platform at one point in time. In order to provide a more complete understanding of what motivates people to engage in the abhorrent, violent, radical activity that we see so often originating on social media, not just in the case of homegrown terrorism, but in more recent acts of terrorism at protests surrounding police brutality, for example, we need to know more about the original stage not everyone we know who Googles how to join ISIS is eventually going to travel to Syria or try to perpetrate a violent act. But at the same time, our understanding of the initial radicalization process, how people begin to become open to more radical ideas, and eventually how they step off that kind of initial uh, ladder onto the train that takes them uh, to perpetrate a violent act of terrorism, is something that future research is needed to understand.